Good afternoon friends, welcome to CEC Edisset live lecture. Dear friends, in this session today we are going to discuss about uh, semantic analysis. We have conducted uh, uh, various lectures on the other analysis also but today specifically we are going to talk on the semantic analysis and for this we have again with us in our studios Mr. Sarfaraz Masood. He is an assistant professor uh, in the department of computer engineering Jamia Millia Islamia. So first of all I would like to welcome our guest Mr. Sarfaraz Masood. Uh, welcome to the Edisset lecture sir. Thank you. Although we have uh, discussed about uh, all the other analysis such as of uh, syntax analysis, uh, but uh, today through you we wish to know uh, what is semantic analysis. Definitely. Uh, welcome uh, everyone once again listening to this uh, channel. Uh, in this series we have already talked about uh, the various uh, analysis. We have talked about the lexical analysis, we have talked about uh, syntax analysis and uh, in today's lecture we uh, look forward towards having an overview about the semantic analysis phase. Uh, if you remember, we uh, talked about the various phases in, in a, a block diagram kind of a structure and we said that uh, the first three phases uh, or the analysis phases actually they make the front end of the compiler. So this is the last of those uh, analysis phases. Uh, this may look like to be a single phase but uh, to be honest this uh, the task of this phase actually engulfs quite a lot of amount of work uh, to follow. So in this phase, uh, in this uh, topic today we will be talking about semantic analysis. But uh, this, uh, the task of this phase will also continue towards another topic that we will be covering in the upcoming lectures like uh, type checking, like intermediate code generation. Uh, so all these uh, phases that we will be talking about are nothing but an extension of uh, semantic analysis. So just to have an overview about what we expect to do in, uh, in today's uh, lecture, uh, we will definitely ha try to have an overview on the syntax related translations. Uh, the syntax directed definitions and translation schemes. Uh, we will also like to talk about some terms like annotated parse tree, uh, topics like dependency graph and uh, an important topic of how uh, syntax trees are constructed and we will definitely end up with some uh, prospective remarks. I definitely deeply acknowledge the various sources from which the examples and uh, images were used for the purpose of the lecture. Okay, so to begin with this uh, thing of uh, semantic analysis, first of all I would like to put up uh, a kind of a difference between what we have been doing till now and what we now expect to do. Uh, till now we have been doing an analysis in a very uh, linear kind of fashion, we uh, extracted tokens from the, uh, from the source program uh, and then these tokens were passed in the same order to the syntax analyzer. The syntax analyzer uh, then checked the order in which these tokens were coming by certain algorithms that it had, so by certain uh, procedures that it had. But now the uh, the, the kind of analysis that we are going to do in this phase is I would say uh, is quite a lot different than what we have been doing uh, in the early phases. As the term says semantic analysis, we are trying to analyze the meaning. So if we have extracted a series of token, let us say int followed by a space then some x as a variable semicolon. So we have a sentence int x semicolon. So definitely we have checked its spelling that is the, the lexemes and tokens. Definitely we have checked the order in which these tokens have come, int is followed by space is followed by an x is followed by a semicolon and we have readily agreed that yes this order is fine. But now the point is do they mean correct? I mean uh, putting all these things together do they, uh, I mean the meaning that we are able to get from this sentence is it right or not? We may have a situation when uh, we have an assignment statement let us say x is equal to y and uh, the way this uh, sentence is written is absolutely fine. But the meaning that this sentence is coming out, I mean that this uh, sentence is giving us is not the one that we expected. For example, on, on one side of the uh, assignment operator we have let us say an integer, on the other side of the assignment operator let us say we have a character. So definitely it is a type mismatch kind of a situation although we have compilers with, which overcome these situations. But if we talk about a very simple and a very straightforward compiler which does not want to have such confusions. So definitely on both the sides of the assignment operation we should have the same types. So if we are having uh, this kind of a situation then this is uh, definitely a type error kind of a situation. So all these meaning related things, I give you a simple example in English also, let us say we, we say a statement uh, she is a boy. So 
spelling of let's say each and every word is fine the way these words are put up as far as the rules of english are concerned are fine but ultimately this this sentence does not mean right i mean the components uh, pronoun and verb and everything is fine but the the components when put together they do not mean right so the same way we uh, we have to check whether the sentences that have been formed uh, the components that have been put together in our source program do they mean right or not so all these things we expect to do so we also call this process as syntax directed translation i'll i would elaborate on this point of why this is being called syntax directed but uh, let's uh, let's all uh, initially define this thing it's actually a systematic uh, process of assigning meanings to the programs which can also be viewed as computations of some special informations also known as attribute associated with the non terminals of the grammar now this is uh, something kind of uh, a long definition that Uh, may initially prove out to be a bit more uh, complex and typical but if uh, we we uh, look into this process in a bit more uh, different way then uh, we would understand that this definition is definitely quite uh, simple so if we break up this thing uh, it says it's a systematic process of assigning meanings to the program so this was our aim we want to find the meaning of a program and definitely this the meaning of the programs is done uh, sentence by sentence so the sentence that we have got the sequence of tokens that we have got first of all we need to try uh, and assign meanings to it so we want to extract meanings we want to assign meanings so this first statement is absolutely fine this is the task of syntax uh, directed translation or semantic analysis now this thing can be viewed as computation of some special informations now we will try and compute some special informations uh, now those informations are actually attributes now these attributes will be associated with the non terminals of the grammar so the point is we are trying to find the meaning of the program we are trying to find the meaning of the sentences of a program and then we are saying for getting those meanings we are having uh, some uh, attributes we are having some special informations called attributes which are being assigned to the non terminals of the grammar so we all know that for uh, a certain language we do, we do have a grammar and this is the source by which we get sentences so if we have a sentence a valid sentence of a, of a language it must be coming from its grammar and grammar has non terminals as well as terminals so we are saying Uh, with the grammar we associate some no, with some special informations we try to compute their values and by those values we get the meaning of the program so it's an indirection and we should be very very careful while understanding this indirection we're trying to find the meaning of the program for which we assign uh, some in, special informations to the uh, to the uh, non terminals of the grammar and by evaluating the information of these attributes we get the meaning of the program so this is the indirection direction we have why is it necessary and why we are doing so Uh, it will be more clear in the upcoming slides to accomplish this task of specification of these translations we have two general approaches one is the syntax directed definition approach and the other one is called the syntax directed translations approach we'll also try and understand the difference between them the conceptual view of syntax directed translation can be presented as we have an input string we try to generate the parse tree once we have it we try to evaluate the dependency graph from it and once we have the dependency graph we get the evaluation of the of the semantic rules okay so we have a grammar we have semantic rules the rules which tell us how the meaning should come from this uh, production but uh, if we have a set of rules then how these rules should be evaluated what should be their order uh, this is the way uh, the meaning will come so this will come uh, this this information will be uh, will be coming in this in this order uh, first you have the input string which uh, by which we try to get the parse tree i i mean if you remember this is the task of the syntax analyzer to give us the parse tree once we have the parse tree we we try to extract the dependency graph from it and once we have the dependency graph we try to find out the evaluation order from it so coming to this slide we'll find it pretty much uh, familiar uh, these uh, this is let's say our parser so we are getting continuous streams of tokens and if you remember these streams of tokens are actually coming from the lexical analyzer so over here we have our lexical analyzer and we said if you remember in the previous uh, lectures that these stream of tokens are given to the parser and the parser generates the parse tree but now we are having a kind of a change in this statement that we said we say that grammar is have i mean the parser is having the syntax or the grammar as well as it is also having the translation rules that means how the meaning will come from uh, i mean for for these uh, tokens uh, that information is also embedded within the parser so if we look physically nowadays it's it's uh, usually found in this very manner that the semantic analyzer or the translator is actually embedded usually hard coded within the parser so it's a component within the parser and not uh, we we usually don't find it separately uh, ahead of it 
So, we get a stream of tokens from the lexical analyzer which are given to the parser and parser with the help of the grammar checks the order in which they are coming if, is that right or not and along with that it also tries to check uh, the, the meaning of it because it also has something called the translation rules, the meaning extraction rules and once it has both these things then actually it tries to generate the abstract syntax tree or the syntax tree or the bytecode or whatever form you want. Okay, so the grammar symbols are associated with attributes we just said. So, this is something that should be remembered. Uh, the grammar symbols, the syntax that is there for the language, it, ha it has non-terminal, it has got variables. So, with those variables, with those non-terminals, we associate attributes, we associate some, in, in, some important information. Okay, so, to associate information with the programming language construct they represent. The values of these attributes are evaluated by semantic rules. So, we write rules actually which evaluate the value of these attributes. Now, once we have the value of these attributes, we say that actually we are trying to deduce the values or the information or the meaning of our own program. An attribute can hold any information. It can hold a string, it can hold a number, it can hold a memory location, it can hold a complex record, any information can be stored um, in an attribute. So, whatever semantically necessary information you are getting, you try to store at that very level in that variable. So, a variable is allowed to have uh, a number of uh, or a set of attributes actually depending upon the semantics that you want over there. So, at any given point of time uh, whatever information you want to find out you simply try to run that definition and by running that definition you get those the values of those uh, semantics of, of those attributes. So, syntax literature translation attaching actions to the grammar rules. Uh, that means attaching some, ru uh, some rules to the productions, the grammar production. We are trying to add some rules, some of the meanings, uh, extraction rules with the production rules. The actions are executed during the compilation, not during the generation of the compiler. So, these rules which will extract the meaning of a program will actually run during compilation of the program, not during the execution of the program. So, the pro when the program is being executed, that is not the time when these rules will be evaluated. Remember, we are going through the compilation. This is the compile time going on, there is nowhere, no, no, no talks about the execution of the program. So, we will try to extract the meaning of the sentences at the compile time itself. So, none of these rules that we will write, none of these rules will ever be evaluated at the runtime. These all will be evaluated at the compile time. Either when replacing a non-terminal with the RHS, that means either we are doing top down parsing or doing we are bottom up parsing because remember as we saw in the last slide that uh, the, the semantic analyzer is embedded within the parser. So, the parser will either be doing top down parsing or bottom up parsing. So, in either of the cases whatever parsing you are doing these semantic rules will run during those times. So, a compiler compiler generates a parser which knows how the parse how to parse the program. The actions are implanted in the parser and executed according to the parsing mechanism. So, we are getting into the sequence that uh, we are having uh, a parser actually that is having the semantic analyzer also once you are doing the parsing at the same time or similar time we are also having this semantic analysis also being performed. So, evaluation of these semantic rules the rules that we are saying now uh, the semantic rules actually when you tr when you evaluate them now this may lead to generation of the intermediate code this may lead to putting some information into the symbol table. This may lead to performing the, the operation called type checking, this may lead to uh, issuing some error messages, may perform some other activities. In fact, from now on most of the tasks that you perform from now on all will be done in, in this very fashion of semantic analysis or, or writing semantic rules and executing them. So, we, you want to perform some type checks, you have to write semantic rules and execute them. You want to uh, generate intermediate code, you have to write semantic rules and th they will be executed. So, most of the tasks that now on will happen will happen in the form of uh, semantic analysis only or writing semantic rules and executing them. So, syntax related definition translation schemes uh, the two topics we, we talked about in the in the beginning of the slides. When we associate semantic rules with productions we have two notations actually. Uh, one of the notation is called the syntax directed definitions and the other notation is called the syntax directed translation schemes. Uh, if we talk about the first one the syntax related definition it gives us a high level specification for translations. It is a high level specification. It is not a detailed description actually. It hides many implementation details such as the evaluation order of the semantic rules or semantic actions. It does not tell that normally. 
we associate a production rule with a, with a set of semantic actions and we do not say when they will be evaluated. So, we simply say that if this is the production that will be uh, that you will be um, requiring or that you will be using or uh, that will be required by the parser, then at this point of time these are the rules that you should evaluate. Okay. So, uh, if let us say there, there is a production D derives T L for uh, let us say the uh, declaration grammar, then at this point of time what meaning do you want from D derives T L? Those set of uh, semantic rules will be written over there. So, it will be written that this is the production, these are the set of rules. So, these have to be evaluated, but when will they will be evaluated? In the beginning of the evaluation of this process, in the in, in somewhere in the middle of this production or the end of the evaluation of this production, that is not described. So, that one part is missing, you are only telling these rules will be evaluated and these rules will give you the right meaning of the program. However, if we talk about syntax directed translation schemes, uh, they indicate the order of evaluation of semantic actions associated with the production rule. So, with each production, whatever semantic actions you are telling that these are the actions that should be performed, these will give you the meaning of the attributes by which you will get the meaning of your program. By not only telling those actions, you also tell the order of evaluation, some, some way or the other you tell that, that this is the time when this rule will be evaluated, this is the time when this rule be, will be evaluated. In other words, translation came, uh, schemes give a little bit more information about implementation details. So, as far as uh, the detailing is concerned, uh, translation schemes gives, uh, give us a better detailing, but definitely they require uh, a bit more kind of a, um, kind of an information in forehand, so that uh, this information can be given at the, at the compile time. Whereas, writing uh, definition is concerned, that is slightly more simpler, because you know, do not need to tell when these rules will be evaluated. But uh, if as far as the practical thing is concerned, then you will have to provide some extra information without which if you only give the definition and then you ask the compiler that uh, extract the meaning, then the compiler would not be able to extract the meaning. You will have to provide some extra information in the form of syntax tree or something else. A syntax related definition is a generalization of a context free grammar in which each grammar symbol is associated with a set of attributes. Now, we are just trying to elaborate the things. Uh, it is not that each grammar symbol will be associated with only one attribute, it may be associated with a number of attributes. Now, as I have been always saying that these attributes will actually uh, be coming from the semantics that you want to refer to. For example, a variable uh, uh, as we say that int space x, so x is a variable, one of the uh, information that it is giving is that its type is integer. Another information that it is saying its width is let us say if we are talking about turbo seeds 2 bytes. Another information we may have that its memory location is what? Another information we may have its value. So, this variable x is having an information type, is having an information size, is having an information memory location, is having another information value. So, there are many faces of information for this variable x. So, for a, for a symbol in your program, you are attaching many meanings to it. So, if you are having many meanings, so you should have various uh, uh, attributes also. So, if, if some uh, grammar symbol is denoting this program symbol x, then whatever meanings you are trying to get in this x, the same meaning should be referred or should be there or reflected by the symbol that is there in the grammar for it. So, if x is having these four meanings and x is coming from a variable let us uh, from a variable let us say e in your uh, grammar, so e is deriving this variable x. So, E should also have all those uh, all those information, E should also uh, have all those faces. So, E will have an attribute, let us say type, E will have an attribute, let us say size, E will have an attribute, let us say val, E will ha also have an attribute, let us say lock or location. So, it is actually you want, in, you want cert certain information for uh, your program symbol. So, look for those informations in the, in the grammar symbol and try to uh, write rules that how these informations will be evaluated. So, it is it's an indirection actually, you are trying to find the meaning of the program, but for that you look into your variables. Because actually the point is that if you try to concentrate on one single program, then by that you will be too specific. But if you try to write rules for the grammar, so that grammar will be singular and by that very grammar you can generate n number of or infinite number of programs. So, it is better to write rules depending upon or directed by your grammar rather than writing rules for a certain program. So, that is why we are saying this is syntax directed translation. The, the way the rules will, the, the way the meaning will come is actually being governed by the syntax, by the grammar. So, 
this is the way i mean this is this is the reason why this everything is rotating around the word syntax are directed the grammar is telling us that how the meaning should come because with each grammar symbol we are associating an attribute we write semantic rules we write semantic actions which tell that how the meaning or how these uh, semantic rules uh, will what these semantic rules will mean so this is the whole story actually uh, about syntax directed translations and syntax directed definition so each grammar symbol is associated with a set of attributes this set of attributes of the grammar can be of the following categories these attributes actually can be of two types they can be synthesized attributes they can be inherited attributes and all this depends upon the property this actually is telling us some something about some properties of the attributes each production rule is associated with a set of semantic rules so each grammar symbol having a set of attributes each production is also having a set of semantic rules so as i said that one symbol may have various attributes each attribute referring to a different semantic situation and for evaluation of each semantic uh, uh, each each attributes value we may have a set of attributes we, we may, i'm sorry we may have a set of semantic rules so if we have a production let's say e derives id so this e derives id we we are actually targeting on a semantic uh, information let's say value so is this e derives id is a production and we want the val uh, attributes value so for that very thing we may write some uh, some production we may write some semantic rules so these semantic rules can be singular they can be one or they can be many so it's not necessary that with each production i will have only one semantic rule for, uh, so just trying to um, get it firm with each grammar symbol we may have uh, a number of uh, attributes we may attach a number of attribute depending upon what semantics we are uh, trying to get and with each production uh, that will have that variable we may have a set of semantic rules so just trying to define this uh, uh, this property uh, in in a more much more defined way uh, in a syntax directed definition each production of the type a derives alpha is associated with a set of semantic rules of the form let's say b is equal to function um, f Uh, depending upon some uh, parameter c1 c2 up till cn where f is a function and b can be of the following so uh, it's just trying to define the things in a much more uh, proper way it says uh, each production is is of the type a derives alpha and then uh, if this is the dependency actually uh, of some information b on some information c1 c2 up till cn over a function f then i would say that b is a synthesized attribute okay so if this is the form then i would say b is a synthesized attribute of a okay so i hope you understand that if this is a production a derives alpha and you try to make a tree of it then a will be the parent and alpha will be the child so it's saying that in one of the cases i would say b is a synthesized attribute if it is an attribute of a that means synthesized attributes are actually the attributes of the parent if you try to see a subtree and c1 c2 cn are the attributes of the grammar symbols in the production a derives alpha so c1 c2 cn actually the gram uh, are the attributes of this alpha so b is the attribute of a and all these c's are actually the attributes of alpha so in such a case b will be called synthesized because b is the attribute of the parent and c's are the attributes of the child or the children so in some indirect way or some informal way i can say that synthesized attributes are the attributes of the parent whose value is actually depending upon depending upon the attributes of the children so attribute value of children is uh, are are telling us how the attribute value of a will be evaluated so in, if this is the case of dependency then i can say uh, b is the uh, attribute of a and c is are the attribute of alpha in case of synthesized scenario however this b is an attribute inherited way is an inherited attribute of the grammar symbol in alpha so if i say b is synthesized then it is an attribute of a if i say b is inherited then b is the attribute of alpha look at this part of the child and c1 c2 cn are the attribute of the grammar uh, of the grammar symbols in production a derives alpha so just to put it in formally we can say that b uh, i mean uh, a synthesized attribute is actually an attribute of the parent and an inherited attribute is actually uh, an attribute of of the child whose values depend upon either the parent or the sibling so as you can see over here if i say this b is synthesized then b is the child b is attribute of a 
and all these are attribute of alpha. If I say B is inherited, then B is an attribute of alpha, any, any child, any, any portion of alpha and all these C's are the remaining attributes. So this is the way, I mean, we can, we can put up this, uh, this relationship of uh, synthesized attribute and the inherited attribute. Terminals only have synthesized attributes whose values are provided by the scanner or the lex analyzer. As I just said that uh, synthesized attributes are those attributes whose values depend upon the, the child's or the children, uh, um, um, children attribute values. So synthesized attribute, if I say this attribute X is synthesized, that means this attribute is actually an attribute of a parent in a subtree. If I say that some attribute X is an inherited attribute, then in that case this attribute X is actually an attribute of a child node in that uh, subtree and its value is either depending upon its siblings or its value is depending upon its parent. So if I say terminals, so terminals will always be the leaf node of a, of a tree. If you, if you try and draw a parse tree, then terminals will always come as the leaf node of a parse tree. So if it is a leaf node actually, then in that case what will happen, uh, these, uh, these in, the information to these uh, 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 these terminals actually, the, the attributes of these uh, terminals will always come actually from the, uh, from the lexical analyzer. So in that case, they value uh, normally do not come from the parent. So the exact terminals that we have, they value will always be given by the scanner or the lexical analyzer, which, will, which actually comes from the lexical analysis part. So they will always have synthesized attributes. The start non-terminal typically has no inherited attribute. Why? The start non-terminal, if you try to draw a parse tree, the start non-terminal will always come as a root node and we all know that root node will never have a parent, neither it will have a sibling, it's singular node. So it can no way whatsoever have an inherited attribute. So if it has an attribute, if it is supposed to have an attribute because there's some meaning coming over there, then in that case it will only, it will always have a synthesized attribute. We may allow some functions known as the semantic rules. Uh, the function called as semantic rules also, they are called side effect functions or side effects. So a parse tree, uh, now we talk about something called the annotated parse tree. A parse tree showing the values of the attributes at each node is actually called an annotated parse tree. So it is a normal parse tree. In that parse tree, you try and show that at each node, at each interior node at or at even at the lower levels, you can show that, that what is the value of the attribute that you are talking about right now. So you try to decorate that, you try to annotate that and the new parse tree that you have is actually now the annotated parse tree. The process of computing the attribute values at the node is called annotation or decoration of the parse tree. Definitely the order of these computations depend on the dependency graph induced by the semantic rules. So uh, you are telling that uh, this is, uh, there is an attribute coming up at this node. So when they will be evaluated that will actually come from the uh, order in which the semantic rules will be guided. The values of the attributes in the nodes of the annotated parse tree are either initialized to constant by the lexical analyzer or uh, determined by the semantic rule. So either they will come from the lexical analyzer, that is they are the, uh, they are the leaf node, they are the terminals or they will be evaluated by the semantic rule. So you are writing semantic rules actually over there that uh, when you execute the semantic rule, a meaning will come. So there, these are the only two ways by, by which we can decorate our parse tree. Either this meaning will be coming from the analyzer or it will be coming from the uh, execution of the semantic rules. If a syntax related definition employs only synthesized attribute, the evaluation of all attributes can be done in the bottom up fashion. Why? It is a very simple thing to understand. We are saying that if in a parse tree all the attributes are synthesized, that means all the attributes are getting the value from their children. That means a dependency is there between the parent and the child in, in, an, in a bottom up way. That is the child's value will tell what will be the value of the parent. So if you try to tell me that if let's say there is a dependent node, okay, and there is a node on which this, this node is dependent. So definitely uh, the node on which there is a dependency that should be evaluated first. So if a child's value is governing the value of the parent, that means the parent's value is dependent upon the child's value. So child should be evaluated first and then the parent. If this is the way the entire behavior of the tree is, then for the entire tree the evaluation will be bottom up. You will have to evaluate the lowest level or the, or the leaf nodes, then their parent, then their parents and this way we go up to the root node. So the entire evaluation of the semantic rules is actually in the bottom of phase. So if everything is synthesized. However, if there is an inherited attribute situation, then the traversal is actually uh, quite very arbitrary. So because we don't, we don't know, uh, it's, it's, the, 
uh, it's the rule that will tell us that how the dependency is there. So we prefer that everything should be synthesized, but that is not the case. It may happen that we are ending up in, in some inherited attributes also. So a dependency graph is something that is very helpful. It suggests the possible evaluation order of an annotated parse tree. It's quite very helpful in, in case of inherited attributes. So a semantic rule of the type b is equal to uh, function of c1 up till cn indicates that attribute b is dependent upon the attribute c1 up till cn. In a synthesized directed definition, a semantic rule may just evaluate a value of an attribute or it may have some side effect function such as printing some values of what. An attribute grammar is uh, a syntax directed definition in which the functions in the semantic rules cannot have side effects. So in that case, they will only tell what the values of the, of the attributes will be. So we at times also uh, put up these attribute grammars also. So we now come up to the example. Now this definitely, uh, this, uh, this example will definitely help you to in, in, in easing out those problems uh, that we normally face in understanding the, this task of semantic analysis. So it's a simple example uh, of a grammar. We have seen this grammar earlier in syntax analysis as well. Uh, we have just added one production elderize en uh, by which actually, so if, if we don't look at this part, right now we just simply forget about this part and we only see at this part. So this part is actually telling how the sentences will be made. But this part is not at all telling me how will they mean. I mean, we are saying e derives e plus t, okay. That means the value of this e and the value of this t will be added and definitely they should be passed on to this e. This is something that we, we understand. But how this understanding should be transferred to the system? So this will be done by, by writing some rules. So first of all, identify your attribute, identify your meaning, identify your semantic. So in this case, let's say we, are, we just only bothered about finding out the value. That is the R attribute. So we are only bothered about finding uh, one of the faces of those meanings. Uh, so this, this entire definition that has been written over here is only concerned with one face of that meaning, that is val. So we are, we are taking this, uh, this attribute val. So you can see over here, just a journal quick view that every attribute, uh, every grammar symbol is associated with uh, with uh, some, some information. So this e dot val, that means an attribute val related to this e, this e, this production. e1 dot val, it means an attribute associated with this symbol e1. t dot val, it means an attribute associated with this terminal, with, with this non-terminal t. Now that attribute is val. You can see all the attributes you can see over here other than this are val, val, val because this entire definition has been written only to identify the meaning of one attribute val. And uh, just for the case of simplicity, we are only having uh, only one uh, semantic rule per production, but that is not the case. We have seen this thing that with each variable, with each non-terminal, we can associate as many number of uh, uh, attributes and for its evaluation, we can have as many number of uh, semantic rules, uh, provided the meaning of this uh, information should come out the way we want. So let's say we had this case of L derives E n, E derives E plus T, E derives T, T derives T star F, T derives F, F derives E n, F derives This is a simple grammar that we have already discussed. Now we have added these, uh, these semantic rules. Now one uh, thing I would like to say, but I, I would uh, describe that later once we do this example. So let's say this was the input string, 4 minus 6 divided by 2 and this n just for the completion part. So if you, if you forget about the, this val, val thing, then this entire structure that you can see over here is nothing but the parse tree word for the sentence, 4 minus 6 by 2. In this parse tree at each node, so this parse tree would have been L derives E n, E derives E minus T, E derives T, T derives F, F derives ID, T derives T divided by F, T derives F, F derives digit, F derives digit. So if I do not write this val information, then this is nothing but the parse tree. In this parse tree, what am I doing is actually also telling the values of the attributes. So as far as this digit is concerned, it's a terminal and its value actually will be coming from the uh, lexical analyzer because lexical analyzer would have already parsed, uh, would, have, uh, would have already extracted tokens from this uh, sentence and is already knowing that this 4 is actually related to this uh, digit, first one, this minus is over here, this 6 is actually related to this digit and this uh, 2 is actually related to, the, to this uh, digit. So this information we are not evaluating, we are simply getting from the 
uh, lexical analyzer. So, this information is definitely a synthesized information. So, this attribute lexval is a synthesized attribute. So, it is you can see over here terminal digit has an attribute called lexval whose value is provided by the lexical analyzer. So, there is no point that it can ever be uh, an inherited attribute, it is a synthesized attribute. But once it has it, now if I do not make you see those rules, you simply see uh, at this uh, slide, this will make your things pretty much clear. Uh, it says you have the value 4 over here, you have the value 6 over here, you have the value 2 over here, this is operation minus and this is operation as divide. So, ultimately what you want, first of all that should be clear, you want the value of this expression and finally you want it to be printed over here, fine. For the evaluation, you want this value to be passed on to this, okay, if this is the, because this tree was not governed by the semantic rule, this tree was governed by the, uh, by the production rules. So, this is the parse tree. So, this is the only way you could have got digit. So, you are having a value over here, but you want this value to be present over here so that this can be evaluated. So, this should be passed on to here, this should be passed on to here and this should be passed on to here, fine. So, this is the way we, we are understanding that this value should traverse, but we should make it traverse, we should write rules for it, for its traversal. So, we say that for this production, look at this production, this is f derives digit or f derives id. If you look into our grammar, we have this production f derives digit. Okay, so, this part of my tree, this subtree is coming from that production. So, if we want the value available here to pass on to here, what rule we will write? We will simply say, if this production ever runs and you have the value at this point, you simply say f dot val is nothing but digit lot dot lex val. Go back to the previous slide and you can see a same kind of a rule being printed over here. f dot val is equal to digit dot lex val. So, this rule has been written, why? Because this is the meaning we want, okay. So, this point should be clear. We are writing these semantic rules the way we want the information to be. It is not that we are getting this information because we are writing these rules. I think this, should, this is more overpowering kind of a situation that uh, these uh, rules have been written the way we want the information to be. Then once we have this information at, at this f, we want this information to be passed on to t. Now, which production is giving us this part t drives f, this is t drives f. So, we go back t drives f, fine. What do we want? The information at f to be passed on to t. So, we say t dot val is equal to f dot val, simple. So, this is a kind of, I, I would say, this is the need that we had. That is why we are getting this thing. So, it is not the other way around. It is it's much more simple to understand if we, have, if we understand in this way. Because this is the way we wanted the information to, tra to travel. That is the very same way we have written the rules. So, there is no point in mugging them up, you simply uh, look at your parse tree, you simply target your attribute, what information do you want to travel, target that out. Once you have that got targeted, then you simply try and find out at each level, at each production, what is the way the information will travel, you simply write a rule according to it. That, that, that can be one single rule, that can be a set of rules, it depends. Similarly, if you have a production of the type E derives T, then simply this will be transferred on to this. Now, just to give you a quick idea, this production T drives F. We write a rule that the value of f will be passed on to t, but this is also true in this part. Look, t drives f again. Again, if you remember, we have written this rule that f dot val will go to t. So again, this is, is this is valid for here also. So this rule, what we what we wrote for f derived digit, it's valid for this case also. So we have written a rule which is actually pretty much uh, um, kind of uh, covering all the scenarios that wherever this production may be used, it's not that it may be used in this case only e, t, f, and digit. Wherever it may be used. Uh, this rule will actually give us the right meaning that we want. So, you, we, you uh, apply this rule here or here or here, ultimately you are getting the right thing. So, your rules should be uh, absolutely the way you want the information to travel. So, t drives val, you give this value to, to e. So, if you, if, if you try to see what, what rule you should have, we will simply write a rule e dot val should be t dot val. And we go back and see e dot val is equal to t dot val. We are telling that the value of t will go to the value, uh, will go to the uh, attribute value of e. So, this is actually what we will read it that the attribute value of val with this t is actually now the attribute value of this val associated with this e. So, these e and t are not getting the values, e and t are only variables, their attributes are getting the values. So, the value of an attribute is being transferred to the value of another attribute, that is the case that that is happening. So, ultimately we have let us say the value of this e, uh, I mean the, the attribute value of this e, we have the attribute value of this t and then at this production, this is a different production, this is not a production of these types, it is a different production. Now, what do we want over here? Ask yourself, we want that this operation should be performed, 
the value of this attribute should be subtracted from the value of this attribute and this should be passed on to this uh, to this attribute val associated with the parent e. So, we write a simple rule sim similar to it. We say that e dot val should be equal to this e dot val minus t dot val. This is, the, this is the information what we want. So, write a rule similar to it and the system will do the same thing for you. So, it is saying if you ever encounter this kind of a production having a plus or a minus or a divide whatever operation you have, if you have this kind of an operation then simply apply this kind of a rule. This is the way the information with these two children will go on to its parent. That is why we say the e, this e dot val is a synthesized attribute. Why? Because its, its value is depending upon the attribute value of its children. This is also an, uh, a synthesized attribute because its values depend upon the value of its child. All these attributes that you see over here are synthesized attributes. That is why this is a, <coughs> it's a, it's a synthesized definition. So, we have this information available over here, then we simply um, look at this part L derives E n and we want to print this information corresponding to this. So, we apply a side effect function and we simply say print E dot val. So, this will happen. So, these are the semantic rules that we want to perform which will evaluate the values of the attributes, but actually these values of the attributes are indirectly referring to the program value attribute, um, the, the program construct uh, values. So, as I have been saying constantly that is an indirect way of finding the meaning of your program. You try to refer those meanings in your grammar symbols you try to associate the same uh, uh, um, information with them, a similar information with them, try to evaluate their values and you will get the information for your own program. So, I hope this simple example has told you one very important part about semantic analysis that once you have the syntax, the parse tree ready with you, just try and identify what information. So, this same parse tree, look, the same parse tree will be used if you want to find out the type information, the same parse tree for this very uh, grammar actually. The same parse tree for this very sentence can be used for, for, for identifying some other information. So, because for uh, if, if, if you all remember, uh, if the grammar is unambiguous, then for a unique sentence, it will have one unique parse tree. It cannot have two different parse trees. So, that very same parse tree will be used all the time, whatever uh, attribute you are trying to target. You are trying to target uh, val, you are trying to target type, size, any information you are trying to target, the same information, the same tree will be utilized, but the rules will change. The most important thing will be the rules will change. Now, how the rules will change? Simply ask yourself, what is the information you want to travel and how do you want it to travel? Once you have that answer, simply write those rules at the right place in, in front of those uh, productions. Another example can be, look, as I have been saying, for the same grammar, if you are trying to identify the location. Let us say this is your target, this is your new information that you find to find out or you want to find out the code or the three address code kind of thing. So, in that very case again, you write a sentence, it will have a parse tree. If let us say I write the same sentence, it will have the same parse tree. But in that case, uh, I am trying to find out some new attributes, I am trying to find out the value of some new attributes. So, over here, you can see the rules have changed and not just one, you can see, you can see many rules are being there. So, it is a, it's a slightly typical example. Uh, which will be uh, um, explained in a more detailed way once we try to understand the, uh, the intermediate code generation phase, we will we'll run through the same example. But this is just an idea about the fact that uh, the same grammar can be, uh, will definitely be used to find out the different informations because one a single line can mean many things to me. Int x, x is integer, x is uh, 2 bytes, x is having a value ranging from uh, some uh, minus 32767 to 32768 or, or any, any uh, range that is defined by my compiler. So, there are many meanings that are associated, there is not just one single meaning to it. Uh, I understand many things from that. So, with this, uh, I mean if, if this sentence is being generated by a single grammar, then uh, all those meanings will come from that very grammar. So, I will have to write uh, one definition for let us say finding out val. I will write one definition for finding out size for the same grammar. I will write one more definition for finding out type. I will write one more definition for finding out location. I will may, I may write one more definition for finding out three address code. So, whatever meanings I want to associate with the same, uh, with the same grammar, I will have to write a different definition for it. So, but if, if I talk about the situation, then for that very sentence, I will have one single parse tree and with, with that one single parse tree, I will uh, I'll run all those uh, semantic rules depending upon the type, the semantic information I want to extract at that time. So, in this example, it is simply saying symbols E, T, F are associated with, with synthesized attributes, lock and code and, and so on. So, we can look into it later on.
Okay. So the last example we talked about was a synthesized attribute example. We quickly run through an inherited attribute example. Uh, it's a grammar for declarative statements. D derives TL, T derives int, T derives real, uh, L derives L1 ID or L derives ID. It's a very simple and a famous example. Uh, in this case, uh, we want to find out, let's say, the, 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 con the point is changing now. Uh, if, if I say uh, this is the sentence I want from this grammar, then uh, this is the parse tree actually that I'll get. This is the parse tree I should only get if this grammar is unambiguous. That is one point of the story. That is very much clear. I cannot get another parse tree from, from this very grammar if uh, this grammar is unambiguous for this sentence. Now in this parse tree, the point is I want the information type. I want the semantic information type. I want to know the type of each and every component. I want to know the type of this ID, this ID and this ID. Okay. So if this is the way, if, if this is the information I want, then how this information will flow in my system? That analysis you want to do, semantic analysis, that meaning analysis you want to do. So you can see there's a, there's a change in, uh, in grammar, there's also change in the, 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 uh, the information being asked. So the, there's a definite change in the semantic rules. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, D derives TL. I would rather uh, go into uh, this information. So you can see that real ID1, ID2, ID3, these information are already being provided to me. So this real is already there. Real is a, let's say, data type. That is already there. Uh, so I have the, the type of this, uh, I mean, I have this information real available to me. So this the type of this T will actually come from this real. So if, if I know the type of this branch, then I can simply put this type to this. So I'll simply write a rule that t dot type is nothing but this real. So if I have t drives real, then I'm saying t dot type is equal to real. If I know that t drives int, then t dot type is nothing but int. So I'm having a similar semantic rule. So a, 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 the semantic rule is telling me that what uh, type do I have? So I've got this type, okay? This, this information I knew, I passed on this information to this. Okay, that's one part of the story. So this t, or type whatever uh, attribute you have associated with this capital T is a synthesized attribute. Again, why? Because its value is coming from its child. Now, this information has to be passed on to this very branch as I can see because I do not know the type of this L, I don't know the type of this L, I don't know the type of this ID, this ID or this ID, I don't know. Only I know is the type of this branch. So definitely, somehow, some way or the other, the information must be transferred from here to here. So if I have a production, I, I, I need to look into this, this subtree. This is D drives TL. So in this case, the type carried by T should be passed on to this L. This is the information I want actually. So because I want this information flow, I write a similar semantic rule corresponding to the production D drives TL. Now look carefully. For D drives TL, I'm saying L dot in, let's say the, the attribute name I've given over here is in. It could have been type, it could have been T, anything. Uh, it's saying that, L dot in will come from T dot type. So whatever type is T is carrying, this will be passed on to this L. A simple rule. Now, if I ask this question that what is the uh, kind of attribute L is having, this in, what is it? So this in is actually an, in, is an uh, inherited attribute. Uh, why? Because its value is actually depending upon the, the value of its sibling. T dot type is a sibling of L dot in. So its value is not coming from its children, its value is coming from its sibling. So this attribute in associated with this L is an inherited attribute. That's the reason why they have specifically used this uh, term in to make sure that this is an inherited attribute, just to differentiate. Okay, by running this rule, this information that the type is real is passed on to this part, that this is also real. Now once I have this information, now I need uh, the information I need the type of this L, I need the type of this ID. So I should have a rule by which these type will be passed on to this. So what is the production over here? L derives L comma ID. We target each production. I have the value of the parent node, uh, of, the, of the parent's attribute. Now I need to pass on this value to its children. So I need to write a semantic rule for it. So I need to target L derives L comma ID. Okay, we'll go to that. L derives L comma ID. I need the value available here to be passed on to its children. So I say that. L1 dot in, an attribute associated with this L1, is nothing but L dot in. So whatever value I had over here, whatever information, attribute information I had over here is being passed on to this part. As well as, if you look closely, I have identified the type of an attribute. 
uh, of, of an identifier. Okay. So, there is no point in, in, in holding this value. Uh, if you remember, we have uh, started making uh, the lex, uh, we have started making the symbol table in the beginning of the phases. In the lexical analysis phase, we said one of the major tasks of the lexical analysis is to, uh, is to make the symbol table also. That will carry all these identifiers that you find in your program. But it will not fill up all the columns in it. It will, it, it will only fill up the, the initial of the columns. The rest of the information will be evaluated at the compile time and they will be filled up at the right time in the symbol table. So, if you look carefully, you have identified the uh, one of the informations for, uh, for, for, uh, for an identifier. So, now you know that the type of this ID is nothing but real. So, no point in holding it. You simply run a function at type. You know, this id dot entry is actually referring to the entry of this identifier in the symbol table and it's saying in front of it simply write the type that you have. So, you have identified the type of this id. So, go and f uh, fill this type in the symbol table. So, it's a very simple function. No need to hold on to this value because you don't have to pass it on to some child of it. Uh, it's, an, it's, it's a terminal. It will not have a child. So, it's better that you, you, you go and fill into the symbol table. So, if you look over here, uh, you can see that you, you have its uh, type, it's passed on to this node and then you also have the type of this id. So, no point in putting up it somewhere, you simply go to the symbol table and make an entry in front of this id's entry that its type is whatever, real, int, char, whatever you identified because this will be needed once you try to go for the conversion process. Now, you have the type of this l and it's having uh, again um, a child um, situation l comma id again you see that this is the same production so need to rewrite things this uh, part of my tree is again governed by the same production i have already written a rule for it this will again come under the same uh, structure this uh, the type carried by the parent will now go on to its children and this id will also get a type the moment it gets a type its entry is actually done into the symbol table at the uh, at the correct location and uh, we then move on from this L to uh, th this situation. Now, this production has changed. L derives ID. It's a different production. L derives ID. What we want again, because we have found out the, uh, the attribute value of the parent, we simply need to pass it on to the child. Child is, a, is uh, an identifier. It's a leaf node. No need to hold on to this value. You simply make an entry into the symbol table at the right position that its type has been identified and it is this. So, this complex looking task of how to find, I mean, how did the system come to know that int space a comma b comma c, we, we write this statement n number of times in a program. How did the system come to know that a is integer, b is integer, c is integer, a type, b type, c type, its values and all those ranges, how did the system come to know? It's a, live, it's a simple example that is telling us that this is the way those semantics were evaluated. This is the way as we understood that uh, a, b and c are integers, a, b and c will have this range, a, b and c will have uh, this size, the same way the system is now uh, able to, the, the, the compiler is actually evaluating that uh, the, this A, B and C or ID1, ID2, ID3 are having this type and similarly if we, if, we, if the next time we try to target the size attribute, now this attribute is, is type, in this entire definition we are trying to find out type, for the same grammar, for the same sentence we may ask size, what will be the size of this id, what will be the size of this id, what will be the size of this id. So, again we will write a complete definition for evaluating size. Over here we will be transferring information for size, then we can also have the information for let us say location, memory location. So, it depends upon what, what uh, information you require. So, for each different semantic information you, you need to extract for your uh, programming language components, uh, you will have to write a semantic uh, definition. So, this is uh, a syntax directed definition. It is not telling the evaluation order how it will be much more clearer later on, but uh, that is the concept that we must understand that this is not telling the evaluation order. As we can see over, it is not telling that when this rule will be evaluated before executing t, after executing t, after executing l. In this tree, d drives t l, when this rule will run, it is not being told. It is simply being told that, okay, corresponding to this production, I have this rule, but when will this rule up, uh, execute, it is not being told. So, that is why we say that syntax related definition do not usually tell the details, the, the evaluation order details. So, uh, as we see in this entire definition, the symbol T is associated with the synthesized attribute type and the symbol L is associated with an inherited attribute. All these attributes L uh, and ID1, uh, I mean this, this L1 were uh, the inherited attributes because you can see in the slide 
that uh, the type of this L came from its sibling, the type of this L came from its parent, the type of this L came from this its parent. So all these uh, uh, attributes were entered. However, this attribute was synthesized. We quickly go through this topic of dependency graph. Uh, it's a directed graph. It represents the interdependencies between the attributes. Uh, it's a simple, uh, the simple way of construction. Uh, we can look by example, actually. We simply need to, I mean, we just need to see that who is dependent, I mean, which attribute is dependent upon which attribute. The, the attribute uh, that is having a dependency uh, sh should be clearly shown that uh, this is having a dependency on, on this uh, very attribute. So you can see this is the same example 4 minus 6 by 2. You can see a dependency graph. You, if you look carefully at the edges, the, these are forming a graph for us. And uh, this is telling us the evaluation order also. So this dependency graph is showing that f is dependent upon digit, t is dependent upon f, e is dependent upon t. This e is dependent upon e as well as the attribute value of t. And the, uh, at the, the l attribute values are actually dependent upon the e attribute value. So this entire direction is actually showing that which uh, attribute value is dependent upon which attribute. So for the other example we did, we can uh, see this pretty clear, uh, clearly that the attribute value of this L is actually depending upon its uh, sibling. The attribute value of this L is dependent upon this. The attribute value of this actually depend upon this and so on. So this graph is clearly showing which attributes value is dependent upon which attribute. So it's pretty much simple. The attribute that on which there is a dependency that should be evaluated first because other than that, we won't be able to have the final answer that, okay, this is the attribute, uh, uh, I mean, this is the way the attribute value will come. So uh, before evaluating the attributes, uh, the L's attribute value, we must evaluate the attribute value of T, simple. So we are getting a clear idea about the evaluation order. We must evaluate this part of the tree, then this part, this part, this, this, and this, and so on. We can also see this simply by the help of something called topological sort. Uh, a topological sort is a directed graph, uh, is a linear ordering of its vertices such that uh, for each directed edge x, y from the vertex uh, x to vertex y, x comes before y in the ordering. So that way we say that it's a topological sorting. So you can simply say, uh, if, if, in, if you look in the previous example, this is the first. That means this, is, this should be evaluated in the beginning. Then this is the second one because uh, it is dependent upon this this should come before L. So this is given 1, 2, then 3, and 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. So this is the way, uh, this is the, uh, if, we, if we simply put it in the ascending order, then this is the evaluation order also. This rule should be evaluated first, this rule should be evaluated next, 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 and next. Okay, so we can uh, quickly uh, wrap up uh, today's session by uh, certain points, still, okay, we, we may cover up these points in the upcoming lectures. Uh, we quickly wrap up uh, today's uh, session by saying that uh, we have uh, talked about the overview of semantic analysis. We have tried to understand some differences between syntax and definition, although we were not able to cover much uh, the syntax and translation scheme, but we would look forward towards covering up in the upcoming uh, lecture. Synthesize and entered attribute, uh, trees, and so on. Uh, as far as references and for further studies concerned, compiler principle techniques and tools by Alfred Aho Ullman Sethi and a new author, Monica Islam, Engineering a Compiler by K.D. Cooper and uh, Linda, uh, Linda Talks on. Thank you. With this note, thank you, sir. Thank you so very much. And I would like to tell all the viewers uh, who, watch, who must be watching us right now that uh, uh, Mr. Masood would be again with us tomorrow and we would be discussing further. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs>